I'd like to welcome you first up for, to Ed Cox. Ed Cox is a dairy farmer from Western Australia and he was being sponsored by, uh, by the Australian Dairy Conference and also Dairy Australia. Thanks, Ed. Um, good morning to you all. Um, firstly, I'd like to say thank you to the sponsors, Australian Dairy Conference and Dairy Australia, um, and also Nuffield for organising my travels. It's the, basically the experience of a lifetime, this Nuffield journey that we've been on, and um, yeah, it's very well organised and a fantastic opportunity. Um, my study topic is dairy farm production and improving forages for dairy cows. My wife Kate and I, we farm just south of Bustleton in Western Australia. Um, we're in a 900 mil rainfall zone and that rains predominantly May through to November. So we've got green grass for half the year. Um, the problem is the other half of the year for milking the cows. We supply basically 85% of our milk is market milk. We sell through coals and woolies. So the, um, they're fairly ruthless coals and woolies and we, um, we've really got to try and keep our costs down for that dry part of the year. So we try and maximise our pasture harvest uh, by utilising silage. We grow quite a bit of maize under pivot. We've got a 50 hectare pivot. Um, our total grass grazing area is 300 hectares on the farm. We're milking between 900 and 1,000 cows. Um, we're trying to keep growing our business. We don't seem to get better margins, but if we can grow our business and hold our margins, we're going to be happy. My objectives with enough fuel basically were to try and improve our forages that we use for the dairy cow. Um, improve silage making, look at alkalage, uh, grain processing and intensive feeding strategies, basically in feed conversion efficiency, try and gain some efficiencies out of how we're feeding our cows. Firstly, in North America, I was looking at their whole crop cereal forages. Basically, this is a bit a barley crop in Canada. Um, they were doing it with wheat, also in Texas. Um, basically, wherever they couldn't grow corn, corn seems to be the predominant um, forage that is fed to dairy cows. Sometimes I think corn, the whole world's revolving around it. America and their biofuels, they rely on corn. Basically, these cereal silages, they're growing to mimic corn. They're maximising starch in them. They let, let them get as mature as possible and they're harvesting really at the dough stage very late, sort of maximising starch. In our rations at home, we always talk about energy and protein and starch hasn't really come into it. You go to North America and everything they do is about starch. Um, these forages are higher in starch. Um, starch content of pasture silage, there isn't any. Um, these have quite a good starch level. With these forages also, they're getting big yields, so it's fantastic tonnages. With a dairy business where you're feeding cows half the year, it's nice to have some forage behind you. You know, you can budget going forward with it. Silage making, there's eight sort of key steps, links in the chain, if you like. There, every single step is important. You muck any of them up, and we really fall down. It costs a lot to grow any crop, and if the, the cows are harvesting pasture, they do not a bad job if you manage it right, but for us to manage this silage job is very important. Firstly, raw materials. It's corn, maize, pasture, or it'll be whole cereal crops. You've got to cut them at the right stage when they're ready. This goes right back to planting. You've got to plant it so you know when you can harvest it, the weather's not going to affect it. Um, you've really got to cut it at the right stage. This, this barley uh, was a hell of a good barley crop, but you can see there's three different varieties there. Um, for various reasons, I've planted the three all, so, all together. The, the barley on the left is ready to harvest. It's getting quite starched up, quite doughy. The other two aren't quite ready. But this was, in Canada, everything happens pretty quick. And these guys were harvesting 40,000 tonnes of silage. Um, they had to go when they had that right weather opening. This is them they're cutting the same crop. Um, cutting stage is important. You've got to get that right to maximise the starch in it. 
wilting for silage. Pasture is pretty important to get the wilt. Basically, it's bringing it to the right dry matter. <coughs> These guys with the cereal silage, the dry matter is nearly there. It's basically cutting in front. They were 12 hours in front of the forage harvester. They two of these swathers um, knocking that over. Um, these cereals don't really need a lot of wilting, they're nearly right to go. With the chopping, these guys are all using a knock. <coughs> uh, this chopping stage is the best time to um, put inoculants in. All this silage is going through that one forage harvester, it's easy just to put the inoculants in then. With these cereals, the inoculant helps by um, rapidly dropping the pH. There are a lot of bacteria inoculant, most of them. Um, and these bacteria feed on the sugars in the silage, drop the acidity and drop the pH, making it very acid. The quicker you can do this, the better quality it will be. They're chopping it to between 8 and 12 mils, the theoretical chop length. Um, this helps in every process, from the cow eating it, um, getting it through the rumen. Um, this is a, a longer chop. This is a dry cow ration in Canada. Um, basically that chop length you can change it to suit the job. Just you choose the length you want and you can dial it up on the forage harvester. Chop length also comes into transport. These guys, it's a really costly part of silage because silage is usually 70, 60, 70 percent moist water. They, they're carting it back and forth to the stack. Some people cart it a long way. It's really costly so you've got to get a full load on a truck and just make everything cost effective. The compaction, these guys in North America, they get that right. They just about go overboard sometimes, these couple of 500 horse tractors, they're just going around the clock, just packing that grass in. The, your chop length, they're, they're very fine, they're getting all the air out of it and um, just helping it. It's an anaerobic process, so they've really got to keep the air out of it. The last sort of job is sealing the stack. This is um, High Plains Dairy in Texas. These guys are milking 5,000 cows and they bring a lot of grass away. You can see here they've, they use a lot of split tyres, which is um, just a tyre chopped in half. So there's two donuts. And where they've sealed seams, you can see they're using whole tyres. They're double covering everything. So they're, um, they're using new products. Uh, there's new types of plastic that are better at air exclusion. Silo stops one of them. And these guys were using that there. This is poorly sealed silage in round bales. We saw a lot, a lot, a lot of silage that um, it was in the pit for 18 years and they were still feeding it in the feedlot. That was in Canada, a beef feedlot we saw. They were doing 40,000 tonnes because the feed grain price wasn't looking very good. They were, um, value added by putting it through their cattle. So we could try and see less of this. The round bales generally they've got to be used fairly quickly. This is in Texas. They're feeding 5,000 cows here, all housed. Um, this was a cross flow barn. Um, there was basically two of these leading out from the dairy, teed off in the centre. These cross flow barns, it's a giant evaporative cooler. One side of the barn has a plastic honeycomb with water um, basically dripping down there. The other side of the barn uh, had between one and two hundred six foot high electric fans. So this was just creating a cross flow cold draft. It was probably ten, nine or ten degrees cooler in here than the outside temperature. I think it was about 26, 27 degrees outside. In here it was just 17, 18. So they really, I think it was about $2,400 a cow this guy had invested in this farm. He was doing it pretty tough when we were there, but I think he'd had a good year before and hopefully that their prices look better now. But it was really interesting to see these guys feeding their cows. They're fed several times a day. The feed's pushed up in front of them several times a day. And um, every day this is cleaned out. They come in there with a loader, take it all out, feed leftover feed to dry cows. This is just the pictures just sort of shows the scale. It's a bit hard to get your head around 5,000 cows. These are just their calves. That was a real eye-opener to see. They've got obviously a lot of Mexican labour, but um, Harry, who owned the dairy, was the only one that lived on property here. And um, our labour focus visited there, it was fantastic. This is his feed centre on Harry's um, 
dairy there. Uh, they had two to three trucks running around constantly feeding. The guys that worked here were actually, they're well paid and these guys were getting bonuses for feeding accurately. All their um, rations came up on the computer and if they were putting 600 kilos of wheat in one of these feed trucks, they were actually paid a bonus to get that right. If they could get it within two kilos, um, that's directly logged to the office and um, they were paid bonuses on getting that right. So they ended up, these cows were fed fantastically well. This is um, staff in Canada. <laughs> now Canada, they're, um, they get paid nearly a dollar a litre. They've still got a quota system, which is fantastic to see. Their dairy farms look after their cows really well. Um, this is a, a young couple only milking about 180 cows. And um, yeah, this is one of their staff. I thought we could probably take it home. It would be fantastic to keep the kids' toys off the veranda. <laughs> <laughs> Um, going on with these cereal forages, I put this in. This is leading on to alkalage. This basically is probably confusing for those of you that don't understand energy and starch and cow ration. But just on the left here, we've got dry matter. These are um, whole crop analysis out of a uh, lab in northern UK, Frank Rock Laboratories. So this is dry matter on the left here. And this is pretty much relates to the maturity of the cereal crop. These 70%, these are all alkalage ones here, there's not a lot of samples because it's not that common yet. Um, that's basically taken through, there's no grain left in the crop. So there's no sugars, it's sort of combine ready if it stopped raining in the northern UK. But you can see here, these are the most interesting things, your, your megajoules of energy and your starch are in this column. And they're maximised when that cereal crop comes through to full maturity. 11.6 MA there and starch at 27%. That's really what you're looking for in a cow ration. The crude proteins have probably dropped away, but it's quite easy to touch that up in the ration. But this is just sort of bringing home most silages are made around here, and um, you know, the energy and the starch can be increased. So, this led me on to sort of alkalage. This is again in Yorkshire, they're making alkalage. This is in a shed, they're a Basically adding an ammonia pellet to it, it's a home and dry is the product, the pellet. It's a, uh, made out of urea, urease and soybean meal. Um, it's ammoniated whole crop alkalage, so it's, the crop's harvested at full maturity. Um, can be done anywhere between sort of 30% moisture, uh, right down to about 80% moisture. Um, it's got a really high pH with the ammoniation. Um, once you've stacked it all in there, mixed it with a pellet, you seal it, so the whole crop's ammoniated. Um, it gives you a very high pH. Um, most of the pHs are coming out above 8. Um, they sort of work on 7 to 8, but usually they're always above 8. This is fantastic um, for dairy cows. Everything we feed them, grain, fresh grass is a pH of 7, which is neutral. But everything else we're putting into them, silage is very acid. Putting grain into the cow's room and is dropping it, dropping the pH down. And acidosis in Australia is a real issue. Subclinical most of it, but it's something we can really work on. And this will be a fantastic forage to feed, just to um, get rid of that. Because of the pH as well, there's no mould. This stuff takes two weeks to ammoniate, and then it's very stable. You can shift it, it's dry. Um, rats and mice just won't go near it. They don't like that pH environment. Um, the ammoniation also delignifies it. So lignin is a part that the cow can't really make any use of the lignin. Um, breaks it down a bit, but this starts to delignify it and makes that more available to the cow. Gives you a bigger harvest window alkalage. Once the, the crop has no grain left in it, it's right to stay there for a week or two, three weeks, um, just till you get conditions right or you get time to get into it. Um, so that's a fantastic um, why for these guys, especially in the northern UK, where it is hard to hard to get it off at the right dry matter conventionally. No fermentation losses. This is hugely interesting to the guys in the states. They're just starting to trial it now. With all silage, even if you make it the best possible way, you're still going to lose 10 to 15 percent um, just fermentation losses in the crop. 
With our bleach, you're not losing a thing. What you harvest is what you get, plus the ammonia pellet. So you're not losing 10 or 15% in the process. Um, and I think energy losses in the future are really gonna become part of our business. The increase in crude protein is very handy as well because of the urea that's going in there. While that's completely breaking down, delete, the delignification is also bringing that protein up and there's a soy bean meal in the pellet itself. This is harvesting our bleach. Sort of kind of looks a bit conventional, but it's a forage harvester fitted with a direct front on it. These forage harvesters have got giant roller mills in them. So basically, as that crop's going through, it's rolling the grain, <coughs> um, processing that grain, and then it's just carted back to a stack. It's basically stacked up, doesn't need to be compacted, and um, covered up with the ammonia pellet inside, and two weeks later it's done its thing. This is what it looks like coming out of the stack. A bit like silage, but it's a whole lot drier. This is sort of 20% moisture. And um, it, 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 it can be done at 30% moisture. And this one's about, about 20. But it's a fantastic dry feed for the cow. Also looked at grain processing. This is 15% grain, uh, moisture grain in the UK that's been milled. It, it's not a bad roll, that. It's a bit dusty. 15% um, is really good. For us, we usually roll in grain at 11%. Um, that's dry rolling grain. This, this grain here at 15% was actually treated with um, the home and dry pellet as well. And they call that alpha grain. Um, so basically, with that pH being changed, you can store grain at higher moisture levels, anything 20% moisture, and it's not going to cause any mould issues or anything. So it's a fantastic way to store cow feed. This is temporal barley, uh, just out of a feedlot, um, and this is the same, same barley sample being put through a normal roller mill. The stuff on the right you can see is rolled at 10-11% moisture and it shatters. Um, not ideal for the cow's rumen, if it's in a total mixed ration it'll do, but this barley on the left is temporal. To temper roll it, basically they're adding 10% water, so it's bringing up to 20-21% moisture. Leave it for 24 hours. Some people use surfactants in there, just your know, everyday boom spray sort of surfactants. Um, that just helps the moisture get into the grain. And then it, 20, 24 hours later, it's put through the roll mill. So it's more flaked. It sort of holds its physical fibre. It, it's going to be a great fit with grass. Tempered rolled barley and wheat has been around even in Australia for a lot of years. It's very common in feedlots. It's a 6% efficiency in the grain use of the ruminant. Um, something I haven't seen or didn't come across anywhere, guys growing pasture that feed grain, this temper rolled grain is really going to make a huge difference. That 6% efficiency in feedlots, beef feedlots, runs through in the dairy feedlots as well. We'll just get a better utilisation of barley in there. Intensive feeding strategies, just bring everything together. Total mixed ration, maximising starch in the ration and delivering it to the cow and trying to keep wastage to a minimum. Feed conversion efficiency has been a big thing in our industry. Basically it's getting more litres of milk out than we feed grain or forages or grass into the cow. Every kilo we put in we want to get a better return on. Fibre levels in grass really vary wildly um, and that's in our pasture based systems we've got to keep that in mind really get that right. Um, if you're feeding high levels of grain, you've got to balance it with fibre, especially if cows are at pasture. In conclusion, just summing up, we've still got to look at our pasture-based systems and maximise pasture production. We've got to improve silage making, change our reliance on grain to forages. The grain price is going to keep sneaking up whether we like it or not, and uh, milk price may not. Grass-based systems really need the addition of starch. The 5,000 litre cow the addition of some starch, it's pretty easy to bring her up to a seven or eight thousand litre cow. Use of alkalage is really going to, I think, come of age. Just cows and acidosis don't mix, and this is going to be a great way to feed a forage that combats it. Tempering grain, it's a no-brainer. It's low cost. Um, you're adding 10% water. There's not a huge cost in it. Um, I think that's got legs in Australia with our pasture-based systems. And basically hybridising your TMR system with pasture-based systems. 
We're just going to get more efficiencies out of our cows. I've just got to thank Nuffield Australia again um, for bringing me together with these guys. Um, this, I think Helen was missing in the photo. She must have been taking a picture, but we're coming out of a cotton, uh, cotton growing. It was a cotton gin on the other side of the railway line there. And the bus got stuck between the north and south bound lanes on the dual carriageway. We had to um, just jump back over and borrow a Volvo loader to pull the bus off the middle of the dual carriageway. As we were dragging it off, we'd scuffed the road a bit and the sheriff turned up. <laughs> he wanted reparations. So we had our bus driver out there and he's talking about how he's going to financially fix this. Um, with that, the Nuffield guys got off the bus. And you can see Deputy Hooper there with his badge and his <laughs> side arm. But this is a fantastic group of people. And um, one of the highlights of my Nuffield experience is the people we make. Um, I've got to thank Dairy Australia and the Australian Dairy Conference again for enabling me to, to do it. And Kate, my wife and family, and staff at home to keep it all going. Thank you very much.